February 28, 1997. North Hollywood, located in the heart of the bank robbery capital of the world, Los Angeles. It's a high-stakes heist gone bad. An urban firefight that rivals battles in war-torn Iraq. It's one of the most violent shootouts in American police history. Television cameras on the ground and in the air capture the surreal scene live. Two paramilitary-style gunmen take over a bank using terrorist technology. Donning full body armor and automatic weapons, they charge out of a Bank of America branch in North Hollywood. With brutal and brazen disregard, they fire armor-piercing ammo into police and civilians. A congested residential area turns into a combat zone. The shootout will end with deaths and dozens of injuries. The roots of the shootout trace back to 1989. Larry Phillips Jr. meets Emil Matasarano, working out at Gold's Gym in Venice, California. Starving to strike it rich, they pump up for a lawless life. Larry already has a long rap sheet. He orchestrated a few real estate scams and was prosecuted for grand theft. Emil Matasarano, an immigrant from Romania, is an unsuccessful software consultant. In October 1993, Glendale, California police pull over Phillips and Matasaranu and discover an arsenal of weapons in their vehicle. After a plea bargain and three months in jail, the two gun fanatics petition the court and retrieve their weapons. By 1996, Phillips makes Matasaranu a partner in his next scheme robbing banks. I think they found something that they were good at, and this might have been the only thing they were real good at. In May of 1996, they robbed two Bank of America branches in the San Fernando Valley and seize over one and a half million dollars. It's all caught on videotape. They were takeover bandits. They would uh, not pass a note. They wouldn't bother with the tellers. They would walk in. Uh, shoot a number of rounds into the ceiling, force everybody to the ground. They stormed the bank wearing masks and uh, some type of uh, protective armor underneath it and obtained a large amount of money for, for a normal bank robbery at that time. Nine months pass before the thugs plot their next heist. The Bank of America in North Hollywood. This particular branch is located at 6600 Laurel Canyon Boulevard, a busy thoroughfare near the 170 freeway. There are two large parking lots on the bank's north and south side. Residential homes run along the back of the bank. Across the street are many commercial businesses and restaurants. They did some research. They staked out and observed the bank and observed the armored car drop-offs and pickups. And they also observed the interior of the bank because they knew exactly where the door was, which was the entrance to behind the counter and into the vault of the areas. February 28, 1997. The robbers dress to kill. Phillips dons 43 pounds of body armor made of Kevlar, a woven substance which is five times stronger than steel. He painstakingly sewed together his body armor, which covers the top of his neck down to his ankles. Matasaranu sloppily made his armor, which doesn't cover his arms and legs. However, he inserts a trauma plate into the front of his Kevlar vest to protect vital organs. You can't buy that body armor. They made it. That shows a lot of planning. The most chilling elements of their plan are the weapons. They assemble three AK-47s with 100 round ammo drums. One M16 fully automatic Bushmaster rifle. An H&K 91 assault rifle, illegally modified to be fully automatic. Two 9mm handguns and a 38 caliber revolver. 
they were familiar with automatic weapons through the books and things that they read. They also load up with close to 3,000 rounds, including armor-piercing ammo, the kind that can penetrate cars, not to mention bulletproof vests, from 200 yards away. Their strategy? Outgun and out-armor the cops. The robbers also wear gloves with stopwatches sewn in them. They got this idea from the film Heat, which features a bank robbery. They will follow the eight-minute rule, the max amount of time spent in the bank. They've determined this is typically how long it takes cops to respond to a robbery. Approximately 8.30 a.m. From their Van Nuys safe house, the bandits head east toward North Hollywood in a white Chevrolet celebrity. Emil was the follower, Larry was the leader, all right? Two complete psychos. Phillips and Matasaranu pull into the Bank of America's North parking lot. While waiting for the bank to open, they both swallow the barbiturate phenobarbital, a muscle relaxant. 9 a.m., Bank of America is open for business. Nine seventeen a.m., officers Lauren Farrell and Martin Perillo just happen to be cruising by. They witness two masked men entering the bank. It's a rare but fortuitous moment. They call for backup. Larry Phillips and Emil Matasaranu storm into the bank. Armed with fully automatic AK-47s, they fire numerous rounds at the ceiling and order everyone to the floor. Definitely a takeover technique, but unlike anything that I'd ever seen, this particular branch had what we call bandit barriers in it, which are glass partitions that go from the counters to the ceilings. With their high-powered weaponry, they were able to uh, shoot open the lock that gained access back there. Phillips forces the bank manager into the vault to fill their money bag. When he sees only small denomination bills, he releases a burst of automatic fire. Larry became immediately enraged and yelled out, where's the money, where's the rest of the money? I know you have more money in this bank. And they didn't, because he altered the delivery schedule. Undaunted, Phillips heads to the bank's ATM machine for more cash. Uh, they tried to get the branch manager to open that ATM. Policies had been changed, and the branch manager no longer had access to the ATM cash. This robbery is far from routine. It will become nothing short of a full-scale military battle. All officers were securing the perimeter and attempting to keep traffic from coming or going. 15 to 20 officers position themselves around the inner perimeter of the bank, known as the Circle of Fire. One of the officers is James Aborovan, who's been out of the police academy for only two months. All the training was kicking in. I was thinking about policy and procedure, tactics. You're looking for uh, tactical superiority. You're looking around you for structures that will provide cover if there is gunfire. Officer Zaborovan and his training partner, Stuart Guy, find cover behind a locksmith kiosk located across the street from the bank. They hunker down alongside detectives Tracy Angelus and John Krulak. Because we were one of the first people to arrive on the location, they were asking for someone to cover the front of the bank, which we elected to do. We thought we had a couple of guys in the bank with nothing but handguns, so we felt pretty secure being across the street behind the kiosk, which is about 50 yards from the bank. My partner and myself had body armor. Unbeknownst to us at the time, the gunman inside had, you know, AK-47s that our body armor does not stop. Yeah, 
North Hollywood detectives and officers find cover around the back of the bank. The strategy in all of these things is to contain uh, the suspects at a, a location, control the situation, and uh, attempt to take them into custody, whether through negotiations or their absolute surrender. Officer Martin Whitfield, six years on the job, and veteran Sergeant Dean Haynes deploy themselves in the intersection closest to the bank's north door. Nine twenty five AM. After approximately eight minutes, the gunmen abandoned the heist with a little over three hundred thousand dollars. They had expected to clear over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, like they had in the previous robberies. Larry Phillips emerges from the bank's north door. Emil Matasaranu exits from the south door. Wearing combat fatigues and clutching AK 47s, they look ready for battle. Phillips eyes police blocking the northwest intersection of Laurel Canyon and Archwood. I believe Phillips was surprised. Uh, he wasn't scared. He saw a police car in the intersection at Laurel Canyon and Archwood. It was Sergeant Dean Haynes and a few civilians. Phillips raised his uh, AK-47 and began firing at the police car. Bullets penetrate Sergeant Dean Haynes' vehicle, causing it to violently shake. Fluids pour out everywhere. I don't think they were skilled at firing. They were more or less spray and pray, as they say, shoot at anything that moved, and that's what they were trying to do. Armor-piercing bullets continue to rip into Sergeant Haynes' black and white. One bullet strikes a male civilian in the chest. A woman suffers an ankle wound. A bullet exits the Kalashnikov. Police are convinced that the patrol car will provide cover. But the slug slices straight through the metal. Another bullet slams into Tracy Fisher. It felt like somebody had taken a baseball bat and hit my foot. The suspect possibly have armor piercing ammunition. Philip's obsession with weaponry has given him the upper hand. He combed the world for ammunition to defeat a police ambush. He discovered steel-plated bullets made in the former Soviet bloc, which can penetrate car metal. He imported them by the thousand. Matasaranu sprays fire in all directions. At the same time, Phillips targets the locksmith kiosk directly across the street from the bank. Within seconds, Sergeant Dean Haynes is shot. He radios for help. This is his actual call. Call three, all officers stay down. Shots are being fired from AK-47. There is an officer down. One of the operators fielding calls at the control center is Guadalupe de la Cruz. She's still training to qualify as a radio operator but she understands the gravity of Officer Haynes' transmission. The worst call that we can possibly get as a radio telephone operator is an officer down, an officer that's injured. That's, the, that's our highest priority. James Aborovan is still taking cover behind the kiosk with his 12-gauge shotgun. When he hears the words, Officer down, he makes a big decision. Nine pieces of buckshot streak across the street and strike Larry Phillips in the upper body. It's a textbook police body shot, and he waits for the gunman to go down. But, concealed under bulky clothes, Phillips is wearing body armor, neck to toe. He spent weeks painstakingly cutting and stitching bulletproof material called Aramid 
into full bodysuits. Both men reinforce their armor with metal plates over their vital organs. Phillips carries more than 18 kilograms of protection, about the equivalent in weight to five bowling balls. Five times stronger than steel, Aramid can withstand the force of the pellets and is flexible enough to absorb the energy. Phillips spun around, he immediately locked on in our position, and for a split second or two, we were looking at each other. He raised that AK-47 and began spraying the fully automatic gunfire. Bullets were racing through the key shop. We were being, you know, hit with shrapnel. And I had realized that the detectives weren't wearing body armor. Zaboravan shields the detectives as best he can. Like Phillips, he's wearing body armor. But his standard issue Kevlar vest is built to resist lead projectiles from small arms, not steel-coated bullets from a high-velocity rifle. A slug rips through his vest into his lower back. A second bullet enters its side and exits his upper leg. It was a very, very intense burning sensation. Almost like I was on fire. After that, it's just every other call that came out was just officers going down. We need help out here with the officers down. Yes, you better get an attack alert here. It was very scary to hear them scared, to hear them hurt and not being able to help each other. Any unit know how many officers are down? We have one. More than one, more than one. They kept saying, one officer is down here, one officer is down there. You think, OK, there's one officer, but they kept saying different places. And finally, I said, you know, does anyone know how many officers are down? Any unit know how many officers are down? We have one. And this guy who was shot, James of Oroban, he screams, more than one, more than one. I was like, oh my god, they are just dead everywhere. At the junction of Laurel Canyon and Archwood, north of the bank, Martin Whitfield is next to go down. In a grotesque twist, Whitfield's fiancée, Kim, is listening to it all on a police radio at home. The gunmen continue blasting at anything that moves. The first news crews arrive on the ground and capture these extraordinary images. Police and medics scramble for cover, unable to get to the injured. News choppers now circle above, providing a live grandstand view to millions of TV viewers. They were uh, actually firing on us right now. On the ground, officers watch their bullets bounce off the gunman's armor. He had body armor all up and down, and our 9 millimeters weren't penetrating. That would just put a stark fear into you because you're thinking, I've already shot at this guy 27 times, and it's like, wow, what? Uh, <laughs> it's not fair. Got heavy bottom armor. Go for the to end the battle, someone needs to take a headshot. But officers are too far away to hit the target with their handguns. James Zaboravan has been shot twice, but he's determined to survive. I said to myself, just because you're shot doesn't mean you're going to die. I'm not going to lay there and resign myself to death. I'm going to get up and fight, take cover, what have you, but I'm not going to stay there. Phillips runs out of ammo and reloads. Working on sheer adrenaline, wounded officers of Oroban and the others attempt to find better cover. Phillips, he would take turns shooting from car to car. And what we would do, we would run from car to car. And those rounds were coming in one door, out the other. We were being hit by pieces of the car, the glass, and... Besides being wounded by bullets, we were actually cut and wounded 
by uh, pieces of the car and asphalt as well. Detective Krulak receives a gunshot wound in the right ankle. At first, it felt like somebody just took and, and hit me in the ankle with a hammer. And with your adrenaline flowing, you're not really thinking about the pain. Both gunmen continue to spray the perimeter of the bank with deadly fire. Their only hope is that the criminals will go. When, seven minutes into the firefight, Mataseranu climbs in the Chevy and shouts at Phillips to do the same, officers pray they'll make their getaway without further bloodshed. If they had wanted to get away at that point, they could have drove out that parking lot right then. But Phillips knows he's packing the bigger weapons, and he's not finished yet. LAPD is faced with an unprecedented scenario. Robbers who want to stay and fight. We had never dealt with a situation like that in the history of law enforcement in, in this country. I mean, this was the first time that they had a shootout of that magnitude. In the parking lot across the street, Zaborovan's partner, Stuart Guy, and Detective Tracy Angeles have fled the kiosk and cower behind two vehicles. But gunman Emil Matasaranu is starting to find his range. <laughs> Stuart Guy is seriously injured. He knows from police training how to enhance his chances of surviving gunshot trauma. He stays as still as he can and controls his breathing. This slows his heart rate, which reduces his blood loss and buys precious time to get rescued. Officer Guy uses his gun belt as a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. His injuries are grave. Detective Tracy Angelus, who received graze wounds on her stomach and buttocks, reassures Officer Guy that help is on the way. At the junction north of the bank, officers and civilians are still pinned down. Officer Whitfield and Sergeant Haynes realize nobody is coming to rescue them. So, when there's a break in firing, they run for help. Haynes trips and falls. Whitfield keeps running, but bullets whistle about him. He decides to take cover behind a tree. He grabs it, but his momentum carries him round until he's exposed to Larry Phillips. A bullet hits his femur bone, dead center. 13 centimeters of bone explode six centimeter splinter through his leg. A fourth bullet strikes him in the chest. Whitfield's distraught fiance, Kim, hears his calls for help. She can't understand why colleagues aren't going in to rescue him. I know I'm losing consciousness. Uh, I'm on Lyle Canyon. Whitfield continues to plead for help using his radio ID code 9L89. 989, I need somebody to help. 989, hang in there. The radio operator who gets his call is rookie Lupe de la Cruz. She knows from her training how critical it is to keep Whitfield conscious. If he stopped talking to me, then they would never find him. So that was just my biggest fear. I wanted to keep hearing his voice and making sure that he was still there. 9089, 9837 is almost there. Hang in there. 9089, hang in there. 9837 is almost there. 9089, thank you. Thank you for talking. Just hang in there a little bit longer. Someone's going to get to you. They're going to find you. Officers Todd Schmitz and Tony Kabunik listen in agony as Lupe de la Cruz pleads for someone to go and help Whitfield. Any unit that's available to respond to 9L89, 6600 block of Laurel Canyon. I have to save him. If I was in that position, man, I would want somebody to come help me. He's losing consciousness. Officer has been hit. They will make a gutsy move. They will enter the line of fire to save a downed officer. At one point, 
Phillips retrieves an H&K 91 assault rifle with 308 caliber rounds, even more deadly than the AK-47. While police fire deflects the robber's attention, Van Nuys officers Todd Schmitz and Anthony Kabunik attempt to rescue wounded officer Martin Whitfield. But as they enter the strike zone, they discover officer Stuart Guy pinned down in the parking lot. There's Anthony Kubanek and Todd Schmitz lift Stuart in the back of the police car and backed out of that parking lot as fast as they could. Without regard for their own safety, those two officers uh, basically braved the gunfire to find uh, downed officers. Some of our gang officers and our detectives uh, went to BNB Guns, Code 3. One officer at a door duty, several AR-15s for the unit. The cops borrow several assault rifles with 223 caliber ammo. But by the time they're deployed, the first SWAT unit arrives. Dave, Martin Whitfield is still bleeding out in the kill zone. 18 minutes into the gun battle, with the police on their knees, SWAT arrives. We're gonna help out here with the officers down here. Before tackling the gunman, SWAT has a more urgent priority, rescuing Officer Whitfield and the civilians. To do this, they need to go right into the heart of the shooting. The question is, how? Then, one of the officers spots something. It's an armored truck with today's cash delivery. Could the 15-ton steel vehicle be just what they need to deliver Whitfield out of the danger zone? Five officers commandeer the truck. They climb in and drive through gunfire towards Whitfield. He's still breathing, but he's lost several pints of blood and is barely conscious. They scoop his motionless body into the back. Now, just the civilians remain in the kill zone, but time is running out for one of them. Mikey was bleeding a lot, and that's what concerned me. I mean, he was sitting in a pool of his own blood. While the armored truck rescues victims, the gunmen are fleeing the bank's north parking lot. Phillips continues to fire rounds while he walks alongside the slowly moving getaway car driven by Mata Serrano. I'm going to guess is that one said get in the car and the other one said no, I'll provide the cover fire while you drive the car down the street. Knowing SWAT is packing automatic rifles, the gunmen make a break for it. Okay, we have some gunfire right now going on. We just saw some uh, proof of smoke coming out of the side. Millions of TV viewers watch Larry Phillips lead on foot while his partner drives the Chevy loaded with weapons and ammunition. We've got one suspect driving the white vehicle from the north parking lot. We've got one suspect on foot. The they are just airs and talk about the vehicle. Do not stop it. They've got automatic weapons. There's nothing we have that can stop them. Officers are desperate to prevent their march into a residential neighborhood. They shoot out all four tires. But this fails to stop them. It was like, oh my God, it's not ending. It won't stop, it won't end. The thing that scared me the most was that these two guys who were clearly the worst people I had ever dealt with, the most dangerous, the most violent, were gonna get away. Phillips appears unfazed as officers shoot out the tires on the getaway car. Inexplicably, Phillips now splits with his partner. Whether he's planning to escape or to inflict more collateral damage isn't clear, but it presents officers with fresh terror. Stay down. There's all kinds of ricochets flying. Stay down, everybody. I'll, I'll say stay down. Shots are still being fired. We've got one suspect on foot. We've got one suspect driving the white vehicle. 
Matasaranu continues to drive, while Phillips ducks behind a tractor trailer. The suspect on foot is behind a long uh, trailer rig. We left the backyard and we headed up the street to cut them off. I was met by Officer Caparelli, who was running away from the corner and shooting back behind him. He ran by me. I said, what are you shooting at? He said, there's another one. He's under that truck. What takes place next is the critical turning point in the entire conflict. And police can't even see it. Hidden by the truck, Phillips attaches a fresh 100-round drum to his AK-47 and continues spraying bullets. A police bullet rips into the thumb on his left hand. He continues shooting, but moments later, his AK-47 suffers what's known as a stovepipe jam. After it fires a bullet, the AK-47 ejects the casing. But if the rifle suffers excess movement, a shell can become misaligned. It then gets trapped in the ejection port. To clear the jam, all Phillips needs to do is flick the trapped shell with his thumb. But because his hand's badly injured, he can't. He's forced to discard the AK-47 and produce his final weapon. It's a 9mm Beretta handgun, exactly the same model as the one carried by the police. Then I'm thinking, <laughs> we're even now, buddy. But Phillips carries on shooting. He stoops to retrieve his dropped weapon and realizes there's no escape. Larry Phillips Jr. is dead. Officers fire at Phillips. One round strikes his hand. He drops his gun. Then he picks it up, points it under his chin, and squeezes the trigger. At the same moment, a police bullet rips through his shoulder and severs his spine. But his partner is still on the loose. He's got three automatic rifles and 2,000 rounds of ammunition. The second suspect, Emil Matasaranu, still flees down a residential street. He suddenly exits the passenger side and blasts the area with automatic fire. Matasaranu then hobbles around to the driver's side. Police now believe he has been hit in the lower leg. It was literally impossible to, to block every side street simply because of the sheer numbers of side streets and, and people that live in the area. Matasaranu suddenly fires through his windshield and strikes an oncoming Jeep pickup truck. He fires three rounds directly through the windscreen at driver Bill Ma. Back window, everything just turns to confetti and uh, pain sets in. All of that in, a, in, a, in the flash of an eye. Bill flees his truck, covered in blood. He's no idea what injuries he suffered. My arm hurts, my head hurts, blood was gushing, uh, but I'll figure that out later. You know, my concern was getting away from the scene. Matasaranu sees a patrol car speeding towards him. He fires a shot, then transfers his guns into the truck and climbs in. It is now he makes an alarming discovery. Bill has taken the keys. Officers wave the SWAT unit down the street. They think they're going to rescue someone injured. Instead, they pull up within feet of the suspect. Matasaranu abandons the hijacked truck and fires at SWAT from the hood of his getaway car. Shots 
SWAT officers pummel rounds under three vehicles toward Matasarana's feet. The suspect returns fire at close range using a fully automatic M16 rifle. The advisor, the suspect is prone out. He may be shooting underneath the vehicle towards officers. The officer is prone out and possibly shooting at the officers from under the vehicle. And looking back at it, I believe we had fired uh, maybe 15, 16 rounds apiece. After almost two minutes of intense fire, Matasaranu drops his weapon. The SWAT unit carefully draws near the suspect. The 9.59 a.m. Emil Matasaranu is handcuffed. The patrol car screams towards the truck but it isn't carrying regular officers. This is SWAT. I fired two rounds through the windshield of the suspect's vehicle. Anderson shoots the suspect flush in the chest. He thinks he's ended the gun battle. I saw the suspect go down. But the suspect is saved by his armor. To Anderson's horror, Matasaranu resurfaces. And I thought, maybe I'm the world's worst shot. They exchange more fire. Then, a SWAT officer's worst nightmare. Anderson's gun jams. As he clears it, he has an idea. Under the car, he spots a chink in Matasaranu's armor. The suspect isn't wearing protection on his lower legs. I proned out, aimed, and continued to fire at the suspect. Finally, with bullets riddling his legs, Matasaranu goes down. He's been shot 29 times, but he's still alive. As SWAT officers move in to arrest him, Matasaranu has a final surprise. As soon as the suspect uh, was handcuffed, the only thing that he kept saying over and over was, shoot me, shoot me, kill me. We didn't respond to the suspect. We returned to the bank. The nearly 45-minute ordeal is over. When the, the shooting stopped and we ran up to Mata Serrano, he was swearing at us. He was angry. Uh, he didn't seem to be in any pain. He just seemed to be real angry that he had lost. Mata Serrano will die before paramedics can reach him. Back on the streets, one injured man is still bleeding out. Emil Matasaranu lies here for 70 minutes until his body succumbs to the trauma and he dies. His family accuses police of letting him bleed to death. LAPD counters that ambulance personnel followed procedure in hostile situations by not entering the hot zone. We did request for paramedics to respond to our location, but we definitely didn't want to just let somebody lay there and die just because they are a suspect. And we also have to make sure that that area is safe. For paramedics, they will not go into what they call a hot area as long as there is a possible armed suspect that is still outstanding. The high incident bandits fired over 1,100 rounds of ammunition. That's a bullet every two seconds. What were they hoping to achieve? They could have made their getaway. When officers raided their apartment, amongst tens of thousands of dollars, they found a possible cause for the gang's bizarre behavior. In the VCR was a copy of the 1995 Hollywood heist movie heat. 
the similarities between the film and the shootout are uncanny. Right down to the fight to the death conclusion. Did a violent fantasy overtake the mind of Larry Phillips?